is saving money. So every congressman, as far as I could tell, wanted to include it in the ACA um, because that let them spend money on something else. So I think those two, those two things um, helped. And then the, probably the most important thing was the, the energy that started to emerge in the places that were doing this early, whether it's Advocate, Tucson, um, the, the excitement of the places that stepped forward, you know, Massachusetts, that said, we can make this happen. Uh, because in, in complex adaptive systems, all it takes is one positive deviant and everybody else starts to follow. So those would be the three things I would I'd highlight. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that I mean, from a legislative side, um, something about having a, a negative number in front of a proposal that doesn't <laughs> cut someone's payment rates that uh, is a good generator of bipartisan support. But that happened because it, of the It sounded like a, that, uh, a, a very attractive unicorn, that, is what you're right, saying. Right, People right, wanted yeah. to believe in it, whether, whether it was real But it not. happened because of the, uh, I guess, the early unicorns. Um, you know, Elliot and I started working on this after I left CMS, and while at CMS we had implemented the physician group practice demonstration. I'm not sure that's a better name than, uh, than ACOs. And, you know, that one's come under a, a bit of criticism lately for, you know, well, it didn't uh, definitively save uh, huge amounts of money. But if you look back at Just it, wait. it's... <laughs> uh, if you look back at it, um, you know, all 10 of those organizations substantially improved uh, uh, population health care so, and quality of care and, and outcomes, uh, no question about that. Uh, nine out of 10 achieved uh, significant savings. Five out of 10 got to the 2% threshold. And if, if you know, we could get half of our healthcare organizations to get 2% off trend per year, uh, that would be enough to, to really change the, the red outlook on that uh, uh, on that chart. Uh, there's certainly some issues around um, as you switch payment systems, it's something that Medicare always sees happen, as you switch payment systems where payments depend more on uh, diagnoses and quality of care, you get more uh, comprehensive reporting of it, and that's uh, typically a, a, a one-time shift. So, you know, I came away from this, and certainly the 10 organizations that were participating in this came away from it, uh, thinking this was a, a good step, you know, not, not enough, but a good, uh, uh, a good first step. That combined with the activities then going on in the private sector, um, I think made a, made a big difference. And it's important to remember that the, you know, the, the, the notion behind ACOs of, of uh, from focusing on better quality and lower cost isn't new. We've had organizations around the country that have done that in uh, different places, California and elsewhere, for years. Uh, what I think was new this time around is that, that fiscal pressure uh, and the opportunities of, of ACOs potentially to do something about it because of its early evidence. Uh, second, um, the, the fact that uh, this round of health care reform is much more um, uh, physician and clinician led than, say, the 1990s effort around uh, health plans, uh, you know, leading efforts, often engaging physicians, but, but ACOs and uh, these provider-based reforms have much more uh, clinician involvement. I think that helps uh, with uh, um, both effectiveness and public acceptability. Uh, and then finally, we're at a different stage in terms of our information capabilities and uh, measurement capabilities and, and um, technological capabilities around But Elliot, you, sp you spoke a bit more about it. This uh, issue that, depending on whether you're in the Medicare Shared Savings Program, where you refer to it as beneficiary attribution, or you're somewhere else and you refer to it as, how do I know my patients are going to stick with me and not go off and use other providers? Uh, you used the phrase, I think it was Stu Gutterman's, you said, the best fence is a good pasture. I was involved in a conversation the other day with some of the pioneer ACO folks, and we were uh, couching it as, what would it take to have all of your attributed population or your members or whatever we're going to call them a year from now or two years from now willingly put on a t-shirt that you gave them that said, <laughs> I'm a proud member of XYZ ACO, you know, with that. What would it take? And is it, now you've talked about some of the uh, possibilities around benefits, structuring flexibility of benefit structure to really entice people in. But really, what would it take to get people to really feel a sense of investment and belonging and want to be with an organization uh, that is going to be the modern ACO? 
I don't think it's going to be about, it's going to cost me more to go somewhere else, so I'm forced kind of financially to stay here. It's going to be about, you know, this place is providing me extraordinary care, surprisingly good care. When I call up, you know, I can get in to see my doc the same day. You know, my doctor, the, you know, or his team, or her team, and, we're t and I feel well cared for. After hours, I know I'm getting great care. And if you look at some of the pilot sites, the Brooklyn's pilot sites that are here, they're, fig they're actually figuring out magnets that you put on the fridge to say, here's how you get help at any time. I, you know, so I think it's gonna be about the experience of care that patients get. It says, why would I go anywhere else when I'm here I can, you know, I'm getting absolutely spectacular care, I'm helping, I'm being helped to make wise choices. You know, Dartmouth makes a big deal about informed patient choice. The problem of wrong side surgery is nothing compared to the problem of wrong patient surgery, um, where patients you know, are, are chosen, you know, are told to get a procedure that if well informed, they wouldn't have gotten. Um, so I think it's when patients feel that they're getting extraordinary, extraordinary care, great access, uh, and wonderful information that helps them and their family members make wise choices, they'll go, I want that t-shirt. You agree? Uh, I, I agree with Elliot, and uh, I think um, this is an area where you know, just another version of alignment is if we can have physicians, other healthcare professionals, and patients can clearly working in the same direction as opposed to the way it's been in the past where there's understandably been a lot of patient distrust that any effort to save money is coming at my expense or the expense of my loved one. Overcoming that uh, is the most important uh, step in a successful ACO and you need the kind of financial alignment that an ACO provides to make that happen. Another uh, kind of soft metric that we discussed the other day with the Pioneer ACOs is what would it take so that every member of your organization willingly put on a t-shirt that says, finally, I remember why I got into healthcare in the first place. <laughs> what, a, what a wonderful, what a wonderful vision. Um, you know, what would it take? I mean, I, we, the Tucson ACO, um, the, the sense that the system is working for the physicians um, to help them do a, a much better job of taking care of their patients and for the nurses and clinical teams. I mean, Pal Evans, who's, you know, came back from retirement to help launch that, you know, is quoted in one of our, you know, the, one of our uh, reports, um, you know, this is the first time since 1974 when I came to medicine that I think it's coming together for the patients. And so I think it's going to be about not someone you know, an organization with which I am familiar well is saving money by telling every department to cut spending by 6% and lay off 6% of their staff. I don't think that's the way we're going to have people in healthcare feeling great. I think it's about great frontline support um, that makes you say, shoot, this is why I came to this work. And I, I, I agree with that. That's exactly right. All right, well, let's open it up to a conversation among all of us and uh, comments, questions, uh, short uh, speeches masquerading as questions uh, whatever. Uh, and we have, there's some microphones we have some microphones so the first the first volunteer for a speech <laughs> let's see we got one right over here uh, if you can pass the mic maybe just pass it. there we thanks, go thanks peter thank you um steve blankshaffer uh, college of american pathologists and also partners healthcare system <clears throat> and uh mark made a really interesting conversation comment in his presentation which had everything in it <clears throat> um, which aligns very well with one of the things I'm very interested in. He observed that the patient-centered medical home and bundled care are sort of separate entities conceptually but in fact we may be making too much of that distinction. As we've been trying to actually implement care that's aimed at our most vulnerable populations we discover those two things are sort of blending together like mercury drops they really need specialty care as part of their medical home. <clears throat> Could you comment on whether uh, those uh, concepts as distinct entities have perhaps become counterproductive as opposed to really needing to come up with sort of a meta concept where they really blend together and provide comprehensive care? Or are they just uh, different tools that ought to go in the same toolbox? And we need to well, think conceptually about it that way. I mean, I think as one, as one, if you look at many of the models that are out there, as they start to think about redesigning care to provide the best 
care possible for distinct clinical populations as opposed to patients one by one, you start to think, how do you provide the best care possible for diabetics? Uh, and that involves the endocrinologists just as much as the primary care physicians and nurse educators. Brent James' work at, at uh, Intermountain Healthcare, or uh, the Project ECHO work of Dr. Arroyo in New Mexico, a hepatologist who's taking care of, as far as I can tell, the whole state of New Mexico and their hepatitis C um, problems. So absolutely, you know, the notion that the medical home can thrive without a medical neighborhood, um, it's not going to work. Um, but I think that the, the, the challenge is to get the, everybody has to figure out how to get on this particular transition in a way that fits where they live today. Um, Neil Colm McCallman, who's a member of our ACO Learning Network in, in the Bronx, gave a, a term that I found really helpful in thinking about this, um, which is that we tend to think of healthcare as redesign, designing a new house, we're going to have this spectacular three-bedroom building that, you know, greenfield conception of how you do this. Um, but in fact, everybody's living in a house right now that has a chimney in one place, a t bathroom in another, the kitchen's in the wrong place, and it's a renovation everywhere. Healthcare, even at the practice level, is fundamentally local. So if we can figure out ways that primary care practices can get on and start to do some do, do relevant work, that specialists can start to align in and outside the hospital and maybe with medical homes, um, I think the three pieces of that puzzle can start to fit together, and in the long run, of course, they have to. Okay, let's, see, let's take another question. Uh, yeah, my name is Pete Paisley. I'm from St. Barnabas in New Jersey. Uh, I just came out of private practice for about 12 years and joined now a hospital employed. And I just always, I'm curious what your thoughts are about why fee-for-service has been so uh, dismissed. I mean, it seems to me it was the model that, that really had been in this country for, for many years. And uh, I think there's some positives to fee-for-service. I think it incentivizes doctors to work harder. Uh, and I just was curious, it seems to me that the bigger issue is specialists that, that specialists in their uh, connection with the technology, it strikes me that that's maybe even a bigger problem. And I mean, at the end of the day, aren't we just going to have to pay specialists less for what they do and pay primary care more? Yeah. Good luck with that question. <laughs> How many yeah, like specialists, said, specialists raise your hands, please? <laughs> uh, Creating a more even balance. Uh, but, uh, um, you know, one of the things about uh, picking up on the uh, uh, Elliot's uh, last answer, and this is something that we're going to talk about in those sessions over the next couple of days that deal with implementing payment reforms. One of the, the things about ACOs is that they certainly have not moved fully away from fee-for-service. Uh, there, there are pieces where they've definitely moved away, and if I, if I was going to oversimplify a bit, I'd say that one of the major pieces is in primary care payments where fee-for-service actually doesn't seem to work uh, uh, really well because many of the things that primary care doctors do today that are very efficient in caring for patients, like answering emails and, and uh, uh, helping with coordination, follow-up, uh, working with nurse practitioners and other practice extenders, are just not reimbursed under fee-for-service at all. And that's not a question of the rates being too low relative specialists. They're just not paid for uh, at all. And that doesn't lead, uh, that, that, that you know, really gets in the way of efficient care and really contributes to those frustrations that uh, Elliot and Susan were talking about earlier. Um, but uh, in many ACOs, they are still relying on fee-for-service for, for certain types, especially services for more individualized care where you, know, you, you got to customize more. And, um, you know, I, I personally think that, that we haven't got the definitive answer to write what the right combination of payment systems really are. I do think, as I talked about earlier, that uh, some movements in the direction of medical homes and bundled payments and uh, ACOs uh, uh, paying on a, a more, uh, at least partially capitated basis is probably the right thing. But there may be other specialties or services where that, that doesn't fit very well. Uh, what I definitely think we need to do, though, is, is get out of this mode of looking at um, the, the kinds of silos that fee-for-service tends to promote. So that's been... Uh, not just a problem for ACOs, but a problem for physician payment generally. The, the fight we have every year over the SGR uh, turns into a circular firing squad among different physician groups because they view uh, the, the, the pie of, of physician payments as being something they just have to divide up with, uh, with, with you know, the, the, the relative value units. And in fact, the right way to think about it is that uh, pie of physician payments is 13% 
of all Medicare spending, and the decisions that physicians make influence 80% uh, of the total. So you can do a lot more by specialists and primary care physicians finding ways to work together to augment and partially move away from fee-for-service to capture some of those overall savings through better care coordinations, through making referrals work more efficiently, through, as Elliot was saying, getting the right patients, the right specialists uh, for the right services.